chapter 18 the text before us for, is from john 18 verses 23 33 to 38 a Jesus was brought from the place of the high priest before Pilate, the governor, who normally lived in Caesarea Philippi, but because it was the Passover, he was in Jerusalem to maintain law and order. The Jewish people did not like, and rightly, a foreign rule in their land. So from time to time, there were insurrections. Rome crushed these freedom movements and because it was the Passover and there was a large gathering during Passover, people coming from all over the then known world to celebrate the Passover at Jerusalem, Pilate was there. So the pre high priest sends Jesus to Pilate. Why? Because they wanted him dead. This was no last minute decision. For the Gospel of John tells us that, and the synoptics as well, that they were planning for an op waiting for an opportune moment to apprehend Jesus Christ and make sure that somehow, by hook or by crook, he is put to death. So there is a maneuvering going on. There is manipulation at work. And they set up Jesus as the king of the Jews. Even though he never aspired or asked for that title. After the feeding of the 5,000, we know that Jesus withdrew because they were forcibly trying to crown him. He knew that his kingdom was not of this world. And it was not from this world. But here, they were successful in bringing him before Pilate. So that Pilate would see him as a threat to Rome. As someone who could lead an insurrection. And disturb Rome and its rule in this region. Pilate, who has been trained not only in general administration, but in philosophy, because in those days it was required of all those who are educated to know philosophy as well. So we assume and presume that Pilate was acquainted with Socrates, Plato and the other philosophers, including Aristotle. A man of law. So he goes out to meet Jesus because they would not enter uh, into the headquarters, but they, they stay out of, the, out of the house so that they would not be defiled ritually. See the religiosity of these people wanting to maintain their religion and their rituals so correctly and yet full of deceit, full of greed and full of power mongering, using every manipulative way to stand against someone who ushers in the kingdom of God, who ushers in a kingdom of love. And Jesus is questioned by Pilate and that is the correct course that Pilate took to ask him questions. What accusation do you bring against this man? 
They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. He had already told Pilate he claims to be the king. And there are a set of people who are following him. And large numbers, the common people heard him gladly. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. They give their intention that this man deserves death. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again. Because they would not come inside. He goes in again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own accord or do others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew. Am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. He makes it clear that his followers and he are not concerned with a clash with Rome. That they are no violent threat to Rome. He is addressing the issue. You think that me and my followers will be violent, will pose a problem for the peace of Judea? Of course, the answer is no. Jesus, then Pilate asked him, so you are a king for this uh, you say jesus answered you say that i am a king for this i was born and for this i came into the world to testify to the truth everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice so, so jesus makes it plain that he is a king His kingdom is not of this world and is not from this world. He was born for this, born to be king. And that all those who seek truth listen to him. And then Pilate asked a question that is the fundamental question in philosophy. What is truth? It is not true and false. What is reality? These are questions that were posed by the great Western philosophers and great philosophers in India. What is truth? What is reality? What is real? And he left it at that and he said, I find no fault in this man. We know the rest of the story. But our focus today is on the statement that Jesus made, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not from this world. With the coming of Jesus Christ, we have the beginning of the new creation. In the incarnation, new creation has come into being. With the new creation comes a new order. Given to us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, five to seven and sermon on the plains in Luke chapter six. These are the values of the kingdom. And God's desire for the kingdom to be in on this earth is expressed in the Lord's prayer. And his mission is made clear to us in the Nazareth Manifesto of Luke 4, 18 and 19, where he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to open blind eyes, to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim the acceptable year, the Jubilee year. Very clear. 
this kingdom, as I said, has broken in into the old creation, the first creation, and the order that exists in the first creation. An order which is not always aligned and mostly not aligned to God and God's will. It is full of sin and evil. There is injustice, lack of love, lack of service, oppressive, and into this, a new order has been ushered in by Jesus Christ. And it is called the rule of God in our midst. A rule of love. God's order of love. Everything is to be ordered around the central understanding of God's love. Which is inclusive, which is sacrificial. We live with the old order and we live also in the new order. Kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. The city of God and the city of, the, of this world. The two worlds, as Augustine put it in his book, The City of God. Luther also spoke about the two kingdoms. They are in conflict. The old order does not want the new order to progress. The old order wants to maintain the status quo. For example, in our country, whenever people have arisen to change the social order that has been there for centuries, which probably was created at first for, with regard to division of labor, but it ended up becoming a division among laborers Uh, an hierarchical system, as Sudhir Kakkar and his wife Katrina say, it is the most hierarchical society in the world. Some are more privileged, others are less privileged, and there is oppression in the system. It is not the ideal situation. Whenever people have arisen over India's long history, there has been a clash and the old order continues to remain there even though it has been challenged. The Bhakti movement, including the movement by Guru Nanak, they Say we are equal before God, including Kabir, but they did not say we are equal before the law. We are equal before the eyes of human beings as well. It was only Ambedkar who raised that issue in the 20th century. But the country is still to say that we should make no reference to caste in our conversation, no reference to caste in paperwork, we are far from it. Untouchability has been abolished, but not the caste system. The struggle between the old and the new continues. And the old doesn't want to give way to the new. Why? Because in the old, there are those who are privileged and have power have money and they do not want to give it up. And therefore they do everything possible to keep it in place. 
God's rule in human society based on love, God's order of love challenges such systems in our country and racism in the West. These are only examples. But we know that there is a conflict in the world because of the new coming into the old system. When the gospel was growing in the early period of the church, when people were being added to the church, they had already been made aware of the values of the kingdom. And once they received power from on high and the gospel was being proclaimed, communities were being formed within the Jewish communities. The Jewish community was intact and within it were these followers of Jesus. It was not at first very clear distinction between the Jews and the Christians among the Jews. They were not even called Christians at that point. They were followers of Jesus, followers of the way. What did they do in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4? They met together. They were a community of caring. They shared with one another what they had. And there was no need among them. Because they looked after each other. And their mission did not suffer the lack of money. They did not have access. But their needs were always met. And they could do the work of the kingdom of God. So we see that happening in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 6, we see a division of labor taking place. And the division of labor is so that the needs of the Grecian women and the Hebrew women would be met in a fair manner. That all would be taken care of. And then in Acts chapter 15, we see the old order that erected a barrier between the Jew and the Gentile being brought down. Brought down from the Jewish side. It is the Jews who erected the barrier with the fellow Gentiles. They lived among Gentiles, made their money among Gentiles, and yet they would maintain a certain distance, a one a distance of superiority. This was not what the teaching of the Old Testament, but that is the way that community evolved. And the, and, and the middle wall of partition is being brought down in Acts chapter 15, where finally they make a decision that they should not put any impediments in the Gentiles coming to faith <coughs> by forcing them to follow all the Mosaic laws, including circumcision, to be accepted in the community. For we are justified by grace through faith. And, and, and the spirit is given to the Gentiles even before they had received baptism. Saying that, showing us that acceptance by God is unconditional. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. But all are accepted when they turn to the Lord and he receives them, whether Jew or Gentile. You can see in the book of Acts how the, the new is forging its way in the midst of the old. But along with it comes persecution. Why? Because some traders are losing business. People don't want to worship idols. They were making big money. They stir up the people and get Paul and Silas and others into trouble. And, and they suffer persecution. And uh, uh, they feel threatened uh, and their businesses are threatened. In history, there are some big events that illustrate this point, especially the many reformations that took place in Europe. Of them, Martin Luther's reformation showcases very powerfully the inbreaking of the new in the midst of the old. Rome had become very powerful under the Pope. 
he wielded power over the Western world because the East and the West had separated and parted ways in 1051, both on theological and for political reasons. But here in 1517, we have Luther saying that what the church is doing and what the church is trying to do is wrong. We are saved by grace and grace alone. He opposes the teachings of the church. For this, he is summoned before the emperor who is told by the pope to take him to task. He is questioned and he stands there before the emperor saying, I am a prisoner to my conscience. I will not I shall not recant. Here I stand. God help me. Here Luther is affirming the value of freedom. And then freedom rings out throughout Europe and in the Western world. And then that same freedom that rang out from 1517 continues to ring out through the world. Many may not know that it was a battle. And we sang that hymn, a mighty fortress is our God today. This was written in the midst of great conflict between the powers that be and Luther, a priest, a small man, but with courage of conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit. But he was terrified. And there are weak moments and he looked very worried and his wife asked him, what troubles you? He did not ask him, sorry, the wife actually wore a black dress on that day and was walking about and trying to get Luther's attention. And Luther said, who has died? And she said, the God of Martin Luther has died. God is still on the throne. In the midst of our struggles, the gospel tells us that even though Jesus was tried and falsely accused and murdered, he rose again from the dead. He was vindicated and he reigns forevermore. As we live our lives in this world, we are members of the kingdom. We are Christians and we are Indians. We espouse the values of the gospel given to us in the Sermon on the Mount and Sermon on the Plains. We know the desire of God for us is to seek his will and to spread his kingdom as given to us in the Nazareth Manifesto. And as we do that, there will be difficulties because there is a clash between the old and the new. And we cannot avoid the clash. But in the midst of it, we are called to put our faith in him who is the Lord of the universe. He has assured us to be with us always. Let us learn to live in his habitual presence so that we may be strengthened in our walk with God and live for the kingdom. Amen.